Okay, so uh, thank you for uh, coming today. So uh, my name is uh, Francis Bosgan, and today I'm going to talk about the uh, KP1 equation. Uh, first, I want to show you this uh, this picture here. This is the effect that I'm going to talk about. This is described by the KP equations. This was uh, photographed um, by the sea uh, uh, next to France. So uh, you should keep in mind of uh, this uh, picture here to do, see what these, uh, these equations describe. So uh, I'm going to talk about the local opposeness of the modified Karonsev Petriashvili one equations. Uh, this was part of my uh, research during um, my PhD uh, at the University of Chicago. So uh, I'm going just to introduce you into uh, the dispersive equations. Well, an evolution PDE is, uh, is dispersive if uh, with no boundary conditions are imposed. It's wave uh, solutions spread out uh, in spaces they evolve in time. They usually come from physical phenomena, and this is uh, one of them. Uh, so the classical KP equations will read as you can see it on the screen. <clears throat> they were introduced uh, by uh, Karontsev and uh, Petviashvili in uh, two Soviet physicists in 1970 to study the transverse stability of the solitary wave solution for the quarter wave degrees, the KDB, the famous KDB which reads ddt of u and the third derivative in x of u plus the nonlinearity u ddx of u equals to zero. So for the kp, we will just add the transverse, uh, the weak transverse effects uh, from the y uh, from the y axis, which will read uh, the <coughs> inverse derivative in x, uh, twice two derivatives in y. So there are two corresponding KP equations. The uh, KP1 uh, corresponds to the sine minus and the KP2 corresponds to sine plus. And the uh, inverse derivative operator is defined via the Fourier transform with Fourier multiplier one over I psi. Uh, and as I told you, we will call that the, the KP term, the DDX inverse uh, DDY, uh, uh, two DDYs. And uh, this will come from the weekly transverse perturbation of the key. So uh, in the past 30 years, there was a lot of uh, research about uh, these equations uh, for both KP1 and KP2. Uh, the KP2 is uh, well understood by now. Uh, it started with some seminal papers of uh, Borgain at the beginning of the 1990s. Well, he showed the uh, local and implicitly global from the conservation of mass on uh, in uh, L2 of R cross R and L2 of T cross T by introducing the famous Borgain spaces XSB, which uh, use in a very inventive way, the uh, Fourier symbol of the linear part, as you can see it over there uh, for the KP equation. And using these XSB spaces, he will devise an iterative Picard scheme and use a fixed point argument in order to get local closeness and then global closeness. For the KP equation, <clears throat> it's not that simple. Uh, and uh, the main reason is that if we usually we started to, uh, or scientists started to, um, prove dispersive, uh, well posed for dispersive equations using fixed point arguments. For the KP equation, this doesn't, uh, this doesn't uh, apply because the flow map will fail to be real analytic uh, in uh, or C2. And uh, therefore this means that you cannot have a Picard iterative method since we know that the flow map will necessarily be real analytic. If it has something, uh, something like this. So this was uh, shown by Molinés so and Svetkov in 2002. So uh, in order to solve, we need to, uh, in order to get well poses for the KP1 equation, we need to do something different. So uh, first, we, was, uh, we noticed that uh, the KP1 as well as the KDV is a completely integrable equation that has inflated many conservation laws. 
uh, I'm going to uh, tell you the main conservation laws that uh, we use. So uh, the L2 momentum, uh, the energy, and there's also a third uh, conservation law that comes from uh, uh, these uh, lex Paris theory that uh, applies well to the KP1 uh, equation. So using these conservation laws, um, so uh, Sauls, Vetkov, and Molina, as I mentioned, uh, they use these to uh, construct a space Z. And you see there the, the norm of Z. So this means that we have to control three derivatives in X, two derivatives in Y, minus two derivatives in, uh, in X. Uh, and in this space, they, uh, they were able to show global opposeness <clears throat> by using uh, uh, the anisotropy of uh, the equation and also the, the, the conservation laws. Uh, Koenig improved this result and uh, proved the world go, uh, global world closeness in 2004 for the second energy space. So here you see that we have to control just two derivatives in X. And the best result was achieved in 2008 by Ernesto Koenig and Tataru, where they showed uh, global world closeness in the first energy space, which of course is the natural energy space. Um, so using just the first two conservation laws, they introduced a refined version of the XSB for gain spaces. They called it the short time free restriction method, and they were able to show this global importance result. Now for the third order. So, so for those results, yeah. the, the, there's also a problem for local work business. So it's both local and global. Yes. Even the local well closeness is not clear, right? Uh, I mean, for for which one? No, no, for those spaces you are mentioning here. Yeah, yeah, the the Koenig and then the UNESCO Koenig Ataro. Uh, here you are saying, okay, they have global well closeness. Yeah. Uh, so global well closeness for small data or large data? Yeah. For any data. Any data. Any data. Okay. But even local well closeness is not trivial no, in those spaces. No, no, it's not. Okay. And does the local well closeness also on the periodic domain? I'm sorry? If the local well closeness here holds also for the, on the periodic domain. On the yeah, I'm going to talk about it. Ah, okay. Yeah, I'm going to talk. Okay, so uh, now we introduce the third order generalized KP1 and KP2. Generalized meaning that instead of a quadratic U DDX of U nonlinearity, we have a U to the power P DDX of U with P greater than or equal to one. Uh, and um, so in 93 showed that it's locally well posed for S greater than or equal to three. Uh, in HS uh, for S greater than or equal to three. Uh, for both KP1 and KP2, but uh, uh, more importantly, he uh, showed in the same paper some several blow-up results for the generalized KP1 equations. Uh, namely, if P is greater than or equal to four, we have that the solution blows up in finite time, uh, meaning that the L2 norm of the DDY of U will blow up in finite time. Uh, this was improved by uh, Liu in 2001, who showed that the blow up result actually happens starting from uh, four over three. And um, he showed uh, also that the DL2 norm of the Y derivative blows up. And uh, Liu's result is the best result that we can uh, expect because we can show that we have uh, global opposeness below four thirds. Um, so both results, we will use some virial type of identities in order to show this. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to uh, start to talk a little bit about my uh, um, research. So uh, my research uh, revolves around the modified Cardon's Pedia Gili one equation. Uh, this means that we have a cubic instead of a quadratic uh, equation, and uh, I'm going to study in uh, anisotropic subvolume of spaces uh, of the type HS1, S2 for both variables. Um, 
So as you uh, notice that uh, this is uh, the modified version of the classical one. And uh, so it appears also in describing some physical phenomenon, uh, for example, Falkovich and Turitsin in 1985, um, used it to describe the evolution of sound waves in some materials that are called antiferromagnetics. For this one, uh, again, the KP2 uh, equation is uh, uh, a little bit easier to treat. Uh, for example, Kenning and Martel in uh, 2006 showed global load poseness in the uh, energy space, the first energy space for our SAR. Uh, Kenny and uh, Zister in 2005 proved uh, local opposes for the modified KP1 uh, on R-R in this uh, uh, in this type of energy uh, uh, space Ys. Here we require more than we have in the uh, first energy, uh, uh, more derivatives in X than we have in the first energy, as I noticed. So now. Uh, we go to our first results. So our first result is that <clears throat> for the modified one, if we have uh, an initial data that belongs to uh, HS0 with S greater than two, then the modified KT1 on R cross R will be locally well posed. It will emit a unique solution for a uh, time that depends on the uh, HS0 norm of the initial data with the norm being sufficiently small. And uh, we have we also have that the, the mapping is, the flow map is continuous in HS0. Uh, for this result, we follow the ideas of uh, Kinnick uh, by uh, trying to obtain an a priori bound on the quantity um, the L2 in time L infinity in space norms of U and DDX of U. Uh, there is a, a modification uh, usually for the KP1. We require uh, an L1 in time norms, but because of the nonlinearity here, we require um, more smoothness in time. So, um, and also, uh, let me tell you that the smallest assumption for the initial data will confirm the fact that the, the scale invariance for the modified KP1 equation uh, does not behave well under the H0 norm. Now, uh, if we change the domain uh, and we consider partially periodic or periodic cases uh, in the variables, uh, we have some other results. Uh, for the KP1 on R cross T, UNESCO and Koenig in 2007 showed global opposites in the second energy space. You notice that here we, we have to bound to uh, two derivatives in X and Y. Then Robert in 2018 proved global opposite in the first energy space for this case. And for uh, the modified one, uh, we have uh, this uh, uh, type of result. So if uh, phi is the initial data in HS with S greater than two, then the MKP1 on R cross T will be locally well posed with T depending again on the HS norm of the initial data, if the HS norm of the initial data is sufficiently small. And again, the flow map is continuous. So, so again, yeah, the space yeah. is different than the one of uh, Robert. Your space. My space, yes, yes. So what's the explanation why in one case, uh, but so, so what's the meaning of that N over C? Like what was it, what, why in one case? It's the N over C is this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why in one case you, you have to use that and in another case you, you are using your just uh, DX and DY. Well, it's yeah. coming from the nonlinearity. The nonlinearity will basically change the estimates, and I cannot. Uh, yeah, so the, the nonlinearity will actually change the estimates that I can use, the linear estimates. And then I can, I will, I'll actually have to uh, take more smoothness in life if I want to 
like uh, add the, the that energy term as well. Okay, now for the uh, fully periodic case, T cross T, UNESCO and Kennedy in 2007 showed global opposite in the second energy space. Um, uh, well, the second energy, as I told you, requires two derivatives in X and Y. Uh, then uh, Jan uh, showed uh, 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 local opposeness in a, type, in a best of type space that uh, you have uh, here. And um, for the T cross T case, we have that if the initial data is in uh, ages of T cross T with S squared than 19 over eight, then uh, the MKP1 on T cross T is uh, locally well posed with uh, T depending on the HS norm of the, the initial data with the initial data HS uh, being sufficiently small. And again, the full map is continuous. The regularity, uh, nine, the regularity here, the, the threshold 19 over 8, it, it's just to say that it's above the 3. I'm sorry, what? The fact here that we have a threshold on S, 3, three larger than 19 over 8. Uh, is it just uh, to say something that larger than 3 or it has a uh, well, limited it's number? Uh, so it's not larger than 3, 19 over 8. Is, that's right. But uh, you're right, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So this is yeah, two, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, actually we need a little bit more than two because uh, this is this is coming from the dispersive, the dispersive estimates that I'm going to show you later. Yes. Okay, so I, I'm still confused about one thing. So you need the smallness to prove the local existence. Yeah, yeah. But if you have large data, you you, you don't need, you don't know whether uh, you I don't know. Yeah, I, I was not able to prove for large data. It's uh, so it's because of because the, usually, the usually like, I mean, in many other cases, if you have small data, you get global existence. If you have large data, you get local existence. Mm -hmm. But here, in a sense, you need smallness to get local existence. Yes, exactly. exactly. So all these uh, global poseness were shown by uh, using a small initial data. And for the KP1, the scaling is good. So basically, we can restrict the small initial data, and then we can generalize for it data. Uh, for, for this, uh, we will not have the same, because of the, this nonlinearity, we will not have the same uh, as, uh, as in the KP1 equation, which is, uh, which is actually normal, because we all already know that we have this uh, Threshold after which we will have like blow up, right? So four thirds. So the modify is after this this uh, threshold. Okay. So now uh, I also want to tell you about this. But, but, uh, okay. Uh, sorry. Maybe I'm. So, but if you assume more regularity, if you are smooth, H yeah. then. Yeah. Uh, can you prove local existence for large data? Uh, yes. Yes. I'm, I'm actually going to. Uh, okay, so you have you have uh, you have local existence, large yeah, data, large data. data, or higher regularity. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um. So uh, actually, if you want to know after after three, you can actually get this. Mm -hmm. So this is like uh, an improvement below that threshold. Uh, so the KP1 equations come from a hierarchy. They are called the KP hierarchy. This comes from uh, the subtle theory of uh, lax pairs. And um, so we get this infinite set of KP equations um, that we can deduce from the lax pairs. The first one, of course, is the classical third order KP equation. The second one will be this one that I uh, I'm showing you here the fifth order KP1 equation. Uh, and um, for this one, there was also a, a lot of uh, uh, research done uh, in the past 20 years. So first saw so in Svetkov in 2000, 2001, showed global uh, world poseness in uh, the first energy space in R cross R and T cross R. Uh, they used Picard iterative schemes for this. Uh, they can you can see here that here 
they can actually use a picor iterative scheme. This comes from the fact that because of the fifth order derivative, we have more smoothness. So we don't have that breakup that happens for the third order one. Uh, UNESCO and Keating in 2007 showed will, will pose this in the first energy space for R cross T. And Robert showed this for T cross T. Um, and also for, uh, let me tell you about the generalized fifth order KP1 equation as Fahani uh, in 2011 showed a blow up for P greater than or equal to four for R, uh, R cross R. Uh, as a remark, we don't know if we have for this case blow up if P is between two and four, uh, but the, the, the scaling threshold for the fifth order KP1 equation is two in this case, as four thirds is the scaling threshold for the third order, which as I mentioned before, is also the blow up threshold. <clears throat> For the third order KP1 equation. So, so okay. um, let, let me ask yeah. another question. Like, uh, can you explain the lax pairs in this case? Like, how, how that works? Um, yeah, so um, I think that Zakharov uh, actually showed, showed some recursive equations for these uh, type of uh, conservation laws. And you can deduce them so by uh, I, I, I think it's something like very complicated. That's why we can actually compute just the first three ones. Um, okay, maybe maybe on the board. Another yeah, time. yeah, probably probably on the board. Okay, so for the fifth order one, the um, initial data, if the initial data is in HS with S squared, then uh, five uh, over two, then the fifth order modified KP1 is uh, locally will pose in R cross T uh, with uh, T depending on the HS norm of the initial data and the initial data is sufficiently small. Uh, again, the flow map is continuous. So now I want to uh, give you some uh, remarks about these proofs. So, um, for the period, periodic and partially periodic, we, we will need to estimate these uh, quantities that uh, in that will look at the L2 in time and infinity in space norms of U, DDX of U and DDY of U. Um, this will help us to get some uh, good a priori estimates. Um, the L2 in time is uh, again coming from the cubic nonlinearity. Um, of course, we need smoothness to control smoothness in X, but in order to control the smoothness in Y is a little bit more subtle in this case. So this actually come from the fact that the dispersive estimates, uh, or strict arts estimates, uh, for the partially periodic and fully periodic case, uh, require more smoothness in the Y period. Uh, meaning that for the cubic uh, nonlinearity. Uh, so uh, in, this is a limiting case for these strict arts estimates. And therefore uh, the linear estimate will require more smoothness in Y when we apply the strict arts estimates that we get. Uh, that's why the difference between the cubic nonlinearity and the usual quadratic nonlinearity, um, we don't necessarily require uh, that much smoothness in Y. Um, for the continuity of the flow map in the partially periodic and periodic setting, well, we'll use uh, a famous argument that is called the bonus meet argument adapted in this periodic setting of the variable one. So uh, my plan for today is to show you uh, an outline of the proof for uh, one of these uh, cases, uh, uh, third order modified KP1 equation on R cross T. So uh, let's uh, let's begin with some notations. Of course, we define by G hat the Fourier transform in both X and Y. We define H S1, S2, the anisotropic uh, sobolev spaces, of course, by the use of the Japanese brackets, to the power S1 and S2. H S will be denoted by this, right? This will be just H uh, of SS uh, or equivalent to H of SS. And um, by age infinity, we'll 
denote the intersection of all the H case. So, so uh, we'll uh, define these uh, smoothness operators, Jx of S and Jx, uh, uh, Jy of S, uh, that on the Fourier side, they correspond to the Fourier multipliers, the uh, Japanese brackets to the power S. So, yeah. okay. Oh, 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 it's just the fully Am I going too fast or should I, should I go a little bit slower? I think you are, that's okay. What about, okay, so here when you say, uh, so it is S1, um, S1 in X, S2 in, uh, in Y, yeah. right? But, right, but you are not putting the, the product, it's the sum. It's the sum, yes. You can also think about the product. So okay, you can think about the space. You are H S one in X with values in H S two in Y. That's a different space. Yeah, that's a different I don't know whether that's used. Perhaps there are problems yeah. with embedding with H S uh, S of variables. Yes, yeah, usually we don't use these spaces, but yeah, uh, th these are the usual solar spaces. But, but say, no, I mean, usually we don't use them. Let's say if you are in Rn when you have uh, isotropy, it's not the kind of space that we use mm -hmm. usually. But but if you are in a case like this where you don't, where it's things are not uh, isotropic, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, like when we when we use spaces in, in uh, space and time. Space and time. In space and time, this is, I mean, usually we will say, okay, I am uh, maybe C2 in time with yeah, values yeah, yeah. in yeah. some space in yeah. that. Um, okay, so um, let me define some uh, cutoff operators here uh, QXK uh, and QYK. So uh, on the Fourier uh, on the Fourier side, this will be, uh, we'll have uh, Fourier multipliers. Just the localization of the absolute value of the frequency, both in uh, x and y, um, in uh, in uh, intervals of the type two to the power k minus one and two to the k, for k greater than one, uh, greater than or equal to one, and for the corresponding operator for zero, it will be between zero and one. And uh, yes, we do this for both x and y. <clears throat> And of course, this will be just localization between in the intervals for the frequencies between zero and uh, two to the k. Uh, so after we know these cutoff operators, we have these uh, following dispersive estimates, the Strickard's estimates for uh, our problem. So um, if uh, W3 of t will denote the operator on uh, age infinity r cross t, uh, given by the Fourier multiplier exponential of i to the psi uh, cubed plus n squared over psi t. So as you see, the, the thing in the, uh, in the exponential is just the uh, Fourier symbol of the kp part. Um, if, we, uh, if we take, um, if, if we take initial data in h infinity in r cross t, and uh, for any epsilon, we get this type of uh, streetcar estimates. Uh, so let me uh, let me tell you a little bit about these uh, these estimates. <clears throat> so as you can see here, we localize in uh, the in x in uh, y, 
so in the frequency for y, and also in time here. So here for the first one, uh, we will take small short time, so short time intervals uh, of type two to the minus j, of length two to the minus j. And for the uh, third one, we'll get time intervals that are even smaller, uh, two to the minus j minus k. So uh, let me explain you uh, heuristically why do we, uh, do we consider these type of uh, uh, localizations and uh, we, why we cannot do global uh, from the start. So um, we, uh, in order to, to show these, we will use some um, either van der Korput inequalities or some theoretical, no, number of theoretical results of uh, veil about some uh, trigonopal and matrix uh, polynomials. So that is for the fully periodic, for the partial periodic uh, type of van der Korput inequality. So uh, as you probably remember, for the function that appears that is uh, oscillating uh, for the van der Korput, and uh, we have for this, let's say phi of n is uh, uh, psi q plus n square uh, over psi everything times t. If we want to have meaningful bounds on uh, the derivative, uh, the derivative you see that is n over uh, psi times t, then if we localize in both psi n and t, then we will find some uh, meaningful bounds for this. Um, after we do this, we can apply some uh, types of van der Kolb inequalities, and then we can find the estimates that uh, we want. Uh, we do the same for both frequencies. After we do this, we just glue together these dispersive estimates to on the time interval of the type minus T and T, and of course, global in space. Okay, using these uh, strict R estimates, now we can get some linear estimates to control the L2 uh, in time L infinity in X norms. So uh, if we apply the KP linear part to a function U that is suitably uh, uh, chosen, uh, and this is equal to a DDX of F, also for a good F, then we get from the strict R estimates, these uh, linear estimates, where we can uh, bound the L2 in time L infinity in space norm uh, of U. You see here that we require, in order to bound this, we require one plus epsilon derivatives in X and one plus epsilon derivatives in Y. And of course here F will be our U to the cube, right? So here I'll have just uh, derivatives for a uh, product of U's. Uh, so this is proven by uh, the dispersive estimates in Buchamel for. Using this, we can uh, uh, now go towards the a priori estimates. So we would like to bound the quantity as I mentioned in the remarks before, the L2 in time L infinity in space norms for U, DDX of U and DDY. Uh, why is this important? It's because we can get the energy estimate uh, for the energy estimate, we can show that if U is in uh, HS of R cross T and it satisfies the initial value problem, the, the modified KP1, that's T, uh, with initial data in uh, HS, then we can bound the L infinity in time HS in space norm of U by the HS norm uh, of the initial data and using the F sub U of T, the quantity that I have above. So that's why it's uh, important to get that bound. So in order to show this, I uh, just construct that uh, a quantity beta f of t. Uh, by uh, using that quantity, I can get that the derivative of the L2 norm of Js of x of u is bounded by the same norm times the beta sub u of t. And then we just you apply the classical Grow is inequality in order to bound the, J, the L2 norm in a space of Jx of uh, S of U by uh, the initial data and also the quantity S of U of T. We do the same for the Js of Y and we, we can get the energy estimates that we want by combining them. 
So um, this is to show why it's uh, it's important to bound that uh, quantity f sub e of t. So now the, the a priori estimates will say that if s is greater than two and the initial data is in the HS of r plus t, then if uh, u is the corresponding solution for this initial data of the initial value problem, then we have that this quantity f sub u of t will be bounded for a suitable small t if the norm uh, ages of the initial data is small. So in order to do this, we apply a linear estimate for uh, u, ddx of u and ddy of u, right? Uh, and of course, uh, the, the most complicated term will be just this one over here, right? Because I'll have just a cube uh, here. So I have to deal with uh, that term. But for that term, I will use the classical cutoff point uh, commutator estimates, uh, where you can see that I can uh, bound uh, JS that are applied to products here. And this is what I will do. I'll do this like several times for the key. OK, some remarks. Uh, the S greater than 2 comes from the uh, Estimates here to bind quantities that arise in our computations. Here you see that I have like one plus a, uh, delta derivatives in X, uh, one plus uh, N one derivative in Y. <clears throat> and um, also another important remark is the smallness of uh, the uh, initial data here is also used in the continuity argument that I used to bound uh, F sub U of T. So basically the continuity argument says that I have F sub U of T is bounded by a polynomial uh, that involves the initial data and F sub U of T. And of course, for small uh, initial data, then I'll have a, also a bound for a F sub U of T. Okay, so now we can uh, start uh, to look at our well posen result. But first, I will uh, talk about uh, the local reporters from Yore and Nunes. So uh, this is actually, if we, uh, as uh, I, uh, uh, Professor Masmudi was saying here, uh, so this is if uh, we consider a smooth, uh, a smooth initial data, then we can actually find that this, uh, actually the generalized uh, KP1 is locally well posed. So by consequence, the modified KP1 will be uh, well posed, and the solution that is corresponding to this will also be in H infinity. So, so, so my advice, like normally, if your if your initial data is in a HS space which is embedded in L infinity, yeah, then you don't care about the power anymore. You, you don't care about if the power is small or large for local existence because you'll be embedded in L infinity. So. I'm not wrong, that's, um, I mean, my understanding at some point is that you have a competition between the dispersion, the dispersion and the nonlinearity, yeah. right? Yeah. And then you have a difference of spaces, mm -hmm. depending on whether it is three or five or what, but, but for local existence, and I, I think this is for any equation, basically, mm -hmm. but for local existence, um, if you are in a space which is embedded in L infinity, yeah, yeah, then the power doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, for a large enough S, yes. right? Okay. So for our local poseness, yeah, I'm just uh, restating it, the one that I told to at the beginning of this talk. Um, so um, yeah, the, the initial value problem uh, for A keep one in R plus T is. Uh, is uh, locally well posed uh, for uh, the initial, the normal deviation that is sufficiently small. <clears throat> and uh, the flow map is continuous. So uh, let me show you the, uh, the roadmap in order to show this. So first we show existing uniqueness in uh, L infinity uh, in time and HS in R cross T. Uh, then we show continuity in time. Uh, <clears throat> That is a continuous in time and in ages of R cross T. And then we show the continuity of the flow map. So, this is a standard roadmap for these type of equations. Uh, for the existence and uniqueness, well, this is also, a, this uh, comes from our approximation 
uh, argument, we take um, we, we take a sequence that is in H infinity that is dense in HS that goes to my initial data, and also it's bounded by integration by part. We hear. Uh, let me just tell you that the U epsilon is the corresponding solution that comes from U zero epsilon. Uh, it's also in uh, H infinity by the Yoyo and Nunes slope of uh, closeness. Uh, and uh, by introduction by part, we get this type of uh, inequality. And uh, of course, you probably recognize that we can apply the Grunewald's inequality here, and we can uh, bound the difference between uh, U epsilon and U epsilon prime in L2 of space. Uh, by the difference of the initial data as in L2 of space. <clears throat> so we'll get that this is a Cauchy uh, sequence, the limit will be U, and this will be the solution of my initial value problem. Uh, of course, by this, uh, by, uh, <clears throat> by this convergence, it's in uh, L infinity in time. The uniqueness will also go come from the same reasoning as uh, the Grunewald's inequality, uh, just take, if this is zero, this should also be zero. Uh, now, in order to show that it's a uh, continuous with respect to time, well, here we proceed by the, the, the so-called uh, Bona Smith argument, uh, but we adapt it to our uh, partially periodic case. So for an initial data that is in the HS of R cross T for S greater than two, we take uh, cutoff functions that converge to phi. Let's call the cutoff operation PK that on the Fourier side corresponds to the multiplier where the both of the uh, absolute values of the frequencies are in the uh, interval zero K. Uh, we can say like, uh, so we have several bounds for these, uh, uh, these cutoff operators. Uh, if we apply G, uh, uh, the operator J uh, P to phi uh, K, we can have uh, that it uh, is bounded by K to the P minus S. And the tail, that is, uh, if we apply the JP to the tail, then it will decay as a little of K to the P to the minus S. So now since uh, these uh, cutoff functions phi k are uh, in H infinity, by uh, again, Yuri and Nunes, they will give rise to unique solutions, uh, u, uh, u sub k in uh, H infinity. So uh, <clears throat> this will go, this is a double aspect argument. So basically we want to show that if uh, u sub k and u sub k prime satisfy both the IVP with the, those initial datas, phi k and phi k prime. And we define the difference between these solutions to be omega uh, with k less than k prime. Uh, then basically in order to show the continuity in time, we will need to show that the, the norm of omega in HS will go to zero. Uh, firstly, we will show that that quantity f sub omega of t will decay as uh, k my, uh, to the power of zero minus. Well, zero minus means any small number below zero here. So we can say like minus epsilon as k goes to infinity. And um, well, why is this true? Well, here the, uh, the, the omega will satisfy the so-called difference equation, right? So uh, we take both IV uh, equations for uh, use of k and uh, use of k prime, right? We take the difference of them and we get this equation here. And we see that this is also a type of a kp equation, right? We have here the linear part of the kp equation for omega, and here this is my nonlinearity. So we have to treat this uh, type of uh, nonlinearity, um, and uh, we apply the linear estimates uh, that I, I got for the, for the linear part of the kp equation for omega, for ddx omega, and dy omega, right? These are the components of the f sub omega of t. Uh, so what do we get? We get that the L2 norm in time, L infinity norm in space of omega will actually decay as k to the minus one minus, and uh, both the ddx of omega and dy of omega in uh, the same norms will decay as k to the zero minus. Okay, so we, we have that f sub omega of t will decay as that. So now, as I told you before, to show like uh, continuity in time, 
uh, we we have to show that the omega will go to uh, zero in HS as k goes to infinity. Uh, so uh, the proof goes uh, the following. So we we apply the the JSXS uh, operator to the difference equation, and we multiply by the JSX over omega. And then uh, using integration y parts and multiple times the cutoff point commutator estimates we get uh, for each nonlinear terms, right? So we have here uh, one, two, three, four, five nonlinear terms. So we have to do for all of those. We repeat for this, the y operator for the JYS operator. And we get these, uh, these very crazy estimates uh, because we have a lot of uh, estimate, uh, terms, nonlinear terms. Um, well, you can see that this actually, we can show that it decays. Uh, well, we have the decay for these type of uh, numbers, right? We have decays for this, for this. So we can show that this actually decays as k goes to the infinity for this part, for jxs. And then we apply the jys and we get, again, like even more complicated estimates. Uh, but um, what is interesting here is that uh, the proofs are not independent. So uh, we have this, the, the, the JYS estimate depends on the first, on the part A estimate, the JXS. Uh, uh, they're coming from this term over here. You see that we don't know decay for this, decay for this, decay for this, but this we actually computed uh, the decay in the part A, so we can, uh, we can get decay for this. Okay, so we can uh, complete the proof that the HS norm of omega goes to zero for S greater than two. Well, from uh, from both of those uh, estimates that I just uh, that I just showed you, uh, we can get uh, this type of estimate, right? Both of these are bounded, and this will go to zero, and this will go to zero as k goes to infinity. So this will go to zero. Same for JS and y. <clears throat> So we get the correlate. And this uh, finalizes the proof of continuity in time. Now the continuity of the flow map is absolutely the same as we uh, do this. Uh, we also use cutoff functions and we use the same type of estimates that we used for the continuity in time, right? We take, uh, we take initial data that goes to the uh, my first initial data NHS and we uh, cut off uh, all the solutions that correspond to these uh, to these uh, uh, initial data, and by the use of the triangle inequality, we can get that the HS norm of uh, the corresponding solutions UL that come from the initial data file minus U will be bounded by the HS norm of file minus U. Uh, and this this actually shows the continuity of the flow map as well. And I think I'm going to stop. Okay. So the flow map is continuous or it is in this case? I'm sorry? The flow map. The flow map, yes, it's continuous. Yes. Not more. Uh, mm, continuous. Continuous. That is interesting. So uh, probably it's mm, probably it's C1, but it's definitely not C2. So for this one, we can apply this. If you remember at the beginning, we said that they showed that we cannot apply an iterative Picard scheme for the R cross T case. For this one, we also cannot do that. Um, Why well, is C1 in this case? Because in general, when we have a contraction, we get the cheats so on C1, but here you... Why? So, um, yeah, I, so I, I don't know if it's C1. Uh, it's definitely not C2, that, that, that is for sure. Probably it's not. So I think that the best case that we can say is just a continuous flow. There are no counter examples of continuous flow. Yeah, there are counter I think there are counter examples. Yes, I think that we can adapt the counter examples. Uh, this is actually what the... Uh, uh, they talk in uh, Kenning and uh, UNESCO paper that they can adapt the counterexamples that they, the sorts Vetkov and Moline uh, used to show that we cannot have the iterative scheme. Uh, they can adapt to the partially periodic and the fully periodic case. So, yeah. 
And for this story about local, we'll call this for small initial data. In general, we expect this at least for some critical species, but when we are at least above this critical space, we can manage to get some time and to, to get local well poisonous for that initial that's so we can understand it. No, but that's it. Yeah, I, I, I think like if you are in a higher regularity, you don't need to small city. Yeah, but, but you slow down your regularity into some critical situation where we have maybe uh, local well poisonous for small initial data, but not really for a range of, uh, of regularity. Because you said for S larger than three, I think you can get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for S larger than two, you can get, but. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you think that between two and three, we need this uh, smallness? Yeah. yeah, we need the smallness. So <clears throat> this also comes from the fact that the, so the, the, the scaling like destroys everything, right? So if we have, uh, so basically if we can show uh if we can show for uh large data for example we can get like small data as well right by the scaling if if this is uh the case um the other way around well we don't know because these spaces are like largely above of the scaling areas that we want uh the kp1 is uh is actually very nice because it has like a good scaling invariance. So they, uh, the, the powers of the nonlinearity stop at four thirds where we have this. Uh, that is the critical case where the L2 is uh, the L2 critical case for the, the KP1. So after that, by the scaling invariance, the L2 norm, if we know for, uh, for small data, the L2 norm will just uh, uh, blow up if by, by scaling. So that, that, that is the problem after uh, after this. And uh, the modified, we um, we already, uh, so we know that is in super critical case, basically. Um, now, yeah, maybe with like some stronger methods, it maybe could work. I, uh, I actually doubt. But I can say a good definite answer. Okay, more questions? Uh, are there questions on Zoom? Google Zoom, I don't know. Yeah. No, no, no it doesn't appear to be any. No. So for this result, at the end, you, you just use this the isotropic as space. So both regularity has uh, in X and Y. Correct. Sorry, for this result, uh, you have just used uh, the isotropic space uh, with regularity S uh, both in X and Y. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you don't, you never use the, the fact that you have the. Two we sets. can, we can actually. Yes, uh, I, uh, I, I made both S's to be equal to be like uh, more okay. straightforward for the the proof and for the talk. Uh, yes, we can actually play. I mean, th there is uh, like a very interesting and. Uh, and also pretty complicated um, interplay between the uh, X regularity and the Y regularity. Um, so we can uh, actually like <clears throat> it comes into play at the time you apply the operator J. Yeah. So so what is like an interesting fact is that we can actually get uh, an equation, a linear equation between S one and S two. So a type of alpha S1 plus beta S2 equals something. And this comes from the interplay of like from the dispersive equations, it's the, the dispersive estimates, the streetcars estimate and so on. Huh? So you can see that we can like grow the, the, the regularity in Y and uh, lower the regularity in X and vice versa. Um, and can one of the two be zero? Uh, no, actually, okay. you, uh, you have results. <laughs> you, you have constraints. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Please get. Uh... Um.